Welcome to CNRL Author Talks, where authors come to talk about their latest books with librarians from the Central Northern Regional Library in New South Wales, Australia. This week, our Senior Information Services Librarian, Ita Hansens, talks with number one best-selling author, Judy Nunn, to discuss her latest novel, Showtime. So my name is Ita. I'm a librarian at Tenwood Library and also Central Northern Regional Library. And I would like to welcome all of you to Judy's talk. And first, I would like, of course, to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from the traditional lands of the Kamilavo people. And I recognize their continuing connection to the land and pay my respects to elders past and present. And I extend that respect to any Aboriginal people present here today. And of course, it's via Zoom. So we're meeting from different lands. So I would also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. And now it's my absolute pleasure to welcome and introduce Judy Nunn, who of course does not need any introduction, but I will anyway for the two people that don't know her. (laughs) So Judy um, has had a successful international acting career, still has one, and she combined it with script writing for TV and radio. Judy has been writing books since the 90s and is one of Australia's leading fiction authors with over 1 million books sold in Australia alone. Unbelievable. And in 2015, Judy was made a member of the Order of Australia for her significant service to the performing arts as scriptwriter and actor of stage and screen and to literature as an author. That's Pretty awesome. So, <laughs> me welcome, Judy. Yay! <laughs> oh, no. thank you, Isa, and all you gorgeous Tamworth people. It's uh, it's lovely to be here. Thank you for that introduction and the warmth of it, Isa. That's lovely. Uh, yes. So um, when I'm out on my live tour, I always love that term, you know, uh, as opposed to dead. Uh, I remember a million years ago when I was working a great deal in the theatre, I was on the same circuit in the big theatres in Melbourne, actually, which it features a great deal in the books here. And and I was playing at the Comedy Theatre in Melbourne. Beautiful, now gone to God, unfortunately, as so many are. Uh, And uh, playing uh, uh, the other side of the road uh, at the Madge was um, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And the great big thing in front of it was um, Seven dwarfs live on stage and I always felt that I mean it would certainly be preferable to seven dwarfs dead on stage it's such a funny term isn't it but in any event uh when I am doing a live performance as in physically able to be there as opposed to digitally here on zoom uh I always open with a a short audio um presentation that my husband makes for me the talented uh, Bruce Venables, actor, um, writer, singer also, extraordinaire. Uh, so Brucey does this for me, for he has for the last half dozen books, and they're very evocative, and uh, it means that I have somebody else telling you a little bit about my book um, in a, a voice that is not this one that you're going to get probably quite tired of after a while. No, I hope not. Anyway, we're here to have fun. But... Uh, uh, Brucey does this and it's a real labour of love and I adore it. So I figured that although I'm not live there, uh, I refuse to be dead, uh, I'll be there digitally and do exactly the same thing. So we'll get Brucey to tell you in his own way a little bit about Showtime. There you go, Ita, if you want to press play. Sure, here we go. My old man said follow the van and go dilly dally on the way. <laughs> Off went the van with me own packed in it. I followed on with me old cock linnet. But I dillied, I dally, I dallied and I dillied. I lost me way and don't know where to roam. Cause I stopped off to have one at the old red tavern And I can't find my way home That particular song was written in 1919 just after the conclusion of the Great War. But it relates to a much earlier time. It's the story of a couple who lose their jobs and can't pay the rent and are forced to do a midnight runner. They get a van and pack their belongings but there's no room for the woman, and her husband tells her to follow the van. Unfortunately, 
she stops for a drink and loses her way. It was meant as a humorous look back at hard times in England during the second half of the 19th century, at the height of the Industrial Revolution, with its filthy mines, black smokestacks, undrinkable water, sickness and death. People were horrified by their living conditions and desperate to escape. The situation led to mass migration, especially to Australia, where gold strikes were weekly events, the air was fresh and clean, and newcomers could hope for a better life. Travelling circus stars Will and Max Worthing and their equally talented wives Mabel and Gertie were four such people who left for the land down under and they are the principal players in Judy Nunn's latest novel, Showtime. From small beginnings, they created the Worthing Brothers family which grew into one of the truly great Australian show business dynasties. Showtime is a story spread over four decades, concluding at the end of the Great War. Along the way, you'll meet the divine Dolores, interpretive dancer, Artie and Alfie, twins, acrobats and fabulous magicians, Carlo and Rube, stars of the travelling boxing tents who go on to become entrepreneurs in their own right, plus Italian sopranos, snake charmers, jugglers, tigers, illusionists and actors extraordinaire. And throughout your travels in Showtime, you'll also meet Emma. But that's me. That's me. That's me. Finally, here I am, at long last. Emma Jane Worthing. Max Worthing is my father, and Gertie Smead is my mother. Although everyone knows her as the divine Dolores, creator of the serpentine dance. I was born on February the 1st, 1901, only a month after Federation Day. Ma and Pa had, of course, been here for years before I came along, but I know the whole family history, which I'll reveal to you as we go along. Uh, oh, oh, where do I start? That's uh, enough now, uh, Em. What? Uh, oh, oh yes, of course. Sorry. You'll get your chance later in the book. Showtime paints a picture of one of Australia's most colourful periods, from the gold mining towns and the travelling shows that entertain them, to the major theatres of Melbourne and Sydney, where the theatrical managements fought to outdo each other by turning their travelling shows into huge theatrical events. Glitzy, glamorous, glittering extravaganzas, which they all invariably advertised as the greatest show on earth. Neither plague, nor smallpox, nor the First World War, nor the great Spanish flu pandemic that followed would slow the spread of Australian show business. Australia's master storyteller, Judy Nunn, will take you on a journey you won't ever want to end in her latest blockbuster, Showtime. Oh, good on you, Bruce. Yay! <laughs> Thanks, he does, he does a great job, doesn't he? Uh, yes, he uh, he writes and performs that with a little bit of me chucked in, which is not usual. We don't usually do that. And records it in a, a professional uh, mate's uh, recording studio. So it's a nice job. And it is evocative, isn't it? It really does evoke something. that, And I like that because it puts me in the mood and I hope it puts people watching in the mood. So there you are. That's uh, that's uh, Brucey telling you a little bit about Showtime. And uh, it, it did those, that great era, that golden days of Australian theatre really did start out with the gold rush in Victoria uh, in the 1850s when um, the, 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 the gold fields of, of Victoria were um, global news. I mean, everybody came from all over the world by, I mean, tens and hundreds of thousands over the following years. And uh, they arrived by ship in Melbourne and then, you know, bought their, their gear and just headed off to the gold fields. Uh, and not, it didn't take very long before entrepreneurs all over the world thought, well, 
all of that number, that vast sea of people gathered in that one area are going to require entertainment. And, of course, the entrepreneurs were right. And they fronted up from uh, the UK, from America, with the, the various forms of entertainment that were hugely popular in the day. Uh, I mean, earlier, in early Australian settlement, of course, there had been, you know, many bits of theatre and this and that, but it really did start up with uh, the, 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 the gold strikes. And out these came, as you know, you heard in the audio there, uh, with the most bizarre acts, uh, touring around with bullet drays and horses and however they could get around these dusty tracks. Uh, and uh, they would have the most ridiculous. They, they would be, you know, of course, bawdy forms of entertainment. I mean, uh, melodrama, classical you know, uh, British melodrama. Uh, there'd be, I'm sure there'd be erotica there. Uh, and there'd be all forms of exotic stuff, exotic dancers and exotic animals indeed. And moving on to, and burlesque, moving on to vaudeville and variety. And also a very popular form of entertainment, which was minstrelsy. Uh, minstrels entertainment, of course, is the big no no today i had to put a thing in the front in the front of the book uh saying uh, you know please excuse me for using blackface performers uh minstrel performers and minstrelsy in general i know this is deeply offensive today which of course it is but it was a very uh popular form of entertainment and what is very interesting i found in all the research i was doing of course is that Minstrelsy, which is always associated, hence it, the disfavour, naturally, uh, is white people blacking their faces up with big cartoon white lips, which is bizarre in itself, of course, uh, and pretending to be black people. Uh, and it's uh, deeply offensive. But would you believe, little known fact, there were many, many minstrel players who were actually black people. They were, uh, as we would say now, African-American. In those days, I have to use also the term Negro, which people don't these days uh, like so much. But hence, you know, please excuse me. This is the times I'm dealing with. And uh, many of these hordes of uh, minstrel companies uh, brought up by the entrepreneurs of the day from America, there were a great number of them were actually black. And the bizarre thing is that the black entertainers had to black their faces up like coal black to be as black as the white entertainers and also use the same big cartoony lips and the same white under liner to their eyes. So their eyes go bug eyed. And uh, so that, it, that in itself is totally bizarre, isn't it? But it was a really valid form of entertainment in which black performers found a great deal. And they were hugely talented people. Uh, and I have a real bloke in the book because as is with my historically based fiction, I love creating my fictional characters, moving through historical times and bumping into real historical figures. So there are the occasional characters in Showtime who are actually real people from show business and, uh, and, and historically, politically. Uh, and one of these guys is, he's Black American called Irving Sales. And he came out to Melbourne with a minstrelsy a, a band uh, in 1888, and he became immensely popular. He actually left the minstrel troupe, stayed on in Australia, um, and set up a duo act of his own uh, with another bloke. He was a fabulous singer, uh, a, a actor, acrobat, evidently also a great um, uh, a physical, you know, he, he played um, a, a, a baseball and goodness knows, so very fit sort of bloke. And uh, he ended up staying on in Melbourne, married uh, a white uh, Melbourne girl, stayed here right through until his death. And I have him touring with my Worthing brothers, as you heard in the in the audio. The Worthing brothers came out actually the same year that, that Irving South came out, 88, well over the end of the gold rush. Um, and uh, they and their beautifully talented wives, Mabel and Gertie. And anyway, the Worthing brothers, and they have their show out on the road and Irving Sales is one of the acts that they've employed on the show. And uh, my darling Gertie, who you met briefly as a young little 
thing coming there on the audio too. Uh, she confronts Irving and, uh, and, and says, she says, uh, Irving, don't, don't you find, because she's worked with minstrels also in the UK, minstrelsy was hugely popular in the UK as well, and she said, Irving, don't, don't you find this a bit sort of insulting, you know, to you lot of people? Uh, doesn't seem right to me, you know. And uh, Irving has this great philosophy he comes back with, which from the research I've done on him is actually appears to be really true. Obviously a very wise fellow. And uh, he's the same age as Gertie, if not a little younger. He came out here very young. But he says to Gertie, well, he says, Gertie, he said, I, I look at it this way, um, that in minstrelsy you have these cartoonish characters uh, you know, played by white people in blackface, but you have the the dandy, the fop, who's a real idiot, and you have the plantation owner, who's a cartoonish character, whom everybody, and then you have all these classic characters in minstrelsy. And uh, so everybody finds them frightfully funny. But he said, when you look at it, the whole essence of it, he said, you've got white people playing black people who are playing white people who are really ridiculous and all the white audiences are laughing. So who do you think they're really laughing at? The white people don't know it, but they're laughing at themselves. So the whole thing is a bit of a taking of the mickey. Well, I mean, whether Irving really believed that or whether it was his philosophical comment on it, I found that really, really, <laughs> I loved it. Anyway, I loved Irving, as Gertie did in the book. And so there's lots of things that I touch upon historically uh, in the book, which, uh, which pleases me, because as I wrote Showtime, I really did find that in many ways I had come full circle because my first two books, The Glitter Game and Centre Stage, were both completely about show business. And uh, the way my publishers are promoting this book, which I absolutely adore, is 30 years of storytelling, which is true. It's 30 years. The Glitter Game was published in 1991 and the centre stage two years afterwards. Glitter Game was just, uh, it was a satire on television, you know, soap. And I was working TV soap at the time, so it was pretty easy to, to you know, do a Mickey take there too. The second book was... Said stage, which was uh, completely about the theatre, set in the theatre. And the theatre was always my first great love. My first professional job in the theatre was when I was 12. And uh, television didn't claim me until my late 20s. So it was a long time and a great love affair with the theatre. And Centre Stage was a much bigger, broader book. Two generations with a thriller aspect and everything. So by the time I came to the third book, which I did say to the producers, uh, to the publishers, oh God, you know, mixing my terminology here theatrically and publishing. Um, I did say, yeah, look, I can wind this, this will be ultimately about movies, but I really wanted to spread my wings. So I brought the ancestor of my one day to become movie mogul, which happened in the 40s, actually, throughout Australia, when, you know, it was a huge movie making area in our history, really big. Charles Chevelle, uh, you know, I mean, all of these, uh, Raymond, you, whatever his name is, uh, they're brilliant. And America hated us being so successful. So they actually put uh, a lid on that. They didn't like Australian movies because we really made really good ones. So I brought out this ancestor in 1850 and settled him next to Dr. Penfold in the Barossa Valley in South Australia making um, wine. And Dr. Penfold, of course, is working out of his beautiful home, the Grange, which, you know, most expensive wine you can get in Australia these days. So I did discover that I thought, oops, I better do a bit of serious research here. So, you know, what about, you know, viticulture and oenology, let alone 1850s, you know, South Australia, goodness knows what. And that was the start of another love affair. I just loved writing historically based fiction. It was about 150 pages before I even started looking movies in the face. I don't, I'm not quite sure how the publishers must have wondered hugely about how they're going to go about promoting this. So, uh, you know, it was a bit of a, a test for them, but it proved very successful. Uh, and I decided right from then on, I didn't have to stick to the KISS principle 
keep it simple, stupid, write about what you know, so long as you research it absolutely within an inch of its life and have a great love affair with your characters because all of my novels are very, very character-driven. Uh, so that was the start of this love affair with historically based fiction. And so now I've come the full circle 30 years. I'm marrying uh, that love affair of my first great, you know, well, great love of the theatre with my love of writing historically based fiction. And uh, with this book, my darling publishers, Penguin Random House, brought out this little gorgeous leaflet, which I adore. And forgive me if it flares a bit, but I'll hold it up. In the middle is this heavenly map uh, and uh, of Australia and all of my books that have been set in these various places, which I didn't know they were going to do that. It thrilled me no end. Until I saw this map, I really did not know that I'd set a book or books a couple of them, you know, in various states, you know, several several books, uh, throughout the entire, um, every state and every territory in the country. Uh, I have to admit, with the exception of the ACT, because Canberra didn't altogether thrill me, but I apologise to anybody from Canberra. Um, so there we have it. And I always do get asked, as I'm sure most authors do, you know, where do you get your inspiration? And I get specifically um, what inspires you about writing Australian fiction. You know, do you study up on some historical aspect or something? Well, I have to say, and I'll give examples of them, just three, because it's varying. It varies, really does. Uh, I mean, to give a first example, for instance, a book I wrote called Territory, which is set not unsurprisingly in the Northern Territory, and it's it was inspired specifically by the city itself, by Darwin, which, of course, was annihilated twice in 42 years, um, once in 1942 by the Japanese bombs and then in 74 by Cyclone Tracy. So it was, it was that specific city that inspired me. But another one might be, for instance, nothing to do with the city, uh, or, but a specific event, and that one I would quote as an example is Maralinga, which is set in the deserts of South Australia. And Maralinga, uh, eponymously, uh, is, of course, the, the name of the secretly uh, set up nuclear testing ground, when I say secretly, between the British and Australian government, but with very little knowledge put out to the Australian people. And so many people today, I think, don't know a thing about Maralinga. And uh, at Maralinga, they blew up bombs, they detonated bombs in higher kiloton energy than was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, doing irreparable damage, not only to the country, but most certainly to our first Australians, to our Indigenous people, uh, because they simply said, well, nobody lives there, it's in the desert. Uh, well, a lot of people did live there, didn't they? And the third example, finally, would be a book I wrote called uh, Heritage, and that is not based around a a specific town, although primarily it's around Akuma and the area, of course, of the Snowies. And it's not based about one specific event. It's about a period in our history that I feel very, very much changed the country. And that was, of course, the early days uh, following World War II from the 50s on for 25 years, but my book is based in the 50s, uh, with the building of the Snowy Mountains hydroelectric scheme. And during that period, of course, uh, there were, I mean, migrants, we, we just opened up to the migrants to come out and work on the scheme, which was the biggest engineering feat ever undertaken in the country. Uh, and we needed all those workers because a whole generation of men had died in the war. So all of these migrants came out, thousands upon thousands. Uh, and the learning curve was not for the migrants who got on very well and who simply wanted to build their shattered lives uh, and start a new life in a new country and uh, with their families. The learning curve was the Australians who were suddenly outnumbered by people who looked different, spoke differently and ate different foods and uh, and uh, Australians had not travelled. So in the big learning, and I believe that was the sowing of the first seeds of multiculturalism. So those are three examples of uh, why I get excited about writing historically-based fiction. 
and how I sort of, you know, uh, adrenalise and all of that. Because it's strange when you do research to that degree, you you discover, you know, well, you rediscover the adage, you know, fact is stranger than fiction. Because as you as you do all this study up, you think to yourself, my God, I didn't know that happened. Golly, boom. Uh, and that excites me. And I figure if I get excited and enthused about our country's history, then hopefully the readers will too. So getting back now to Showtime, of course, uh, given the, the, the current parameters set about uh, for us all with, with COVID, um, it was impossible for me to do the research trips I always do when I go to whichever area I write about. Uh, and I couldn't go to Melbourne. The book is primarily set in Melbourne, given, as I was saying earlier, about the, the gold rush. And the fact that after these bizarre shows that came out and travelled all the dusty roads to all of those areas where gold had been discovered and then beyond, uh, those, those areas, which were just campsites, very quickly grew into uh, magnificent towns. Uh, and the first things, of course, they're going to put up is going to be a pub beautiful old stone pubs and everything. Every miner needs a pub. There's going to be a post office with its proud tower, clock tower, whatever, and a, uh, a town hall, and inevitably, very quickly, a theatre. So these rather magnificent theatres grew out of, and the shows became more sophisticated. Uh, that they, they, they became very, very, very fond of Gilbert and Sullivan, operatic opera, um, actually musical theatre like the Merry... Uh, Merry Widow, uh, which is much, much older musical than I'd ever known, actually. I didn't know it was that old. And uh, and quickly followed by Shakespeare. Oh, Shakespeare was very, very popular. That beautiful rave reviews about the latest King Lear or whatever. Um, and uh, and then following on the heels of that, of course, Oscar Wilde. And things became very sophisticated. And Melbourne became the mecca of Australian theatre, very closely followed, of course, by the usual war between Sydney. Anything you can do, we can do better and vice versa. Love all that. And I'm able to get away with saying it because my original hometown is Perth. Oh, gosh, we are funny. Um, so anyway, you've got Melbourne fighting Sydney, Sydney fighting Melbourne. And my protagonists in the theatre, my Carlo and Rube and my Worthing brothers, they become great combatants in this, uh, combatants in this fight between Sydney and Melbourne. But a great deal of the book, of course, is set in Melbourne. And I couldn't get to Melbourne, of course. I live in Sydney. Uh, and uh, that was a blow. But fortunately for me, and particularly the theatre me, I've worked a great deal in Melbourne over the years, uh, not only in television back in the 70s, but also uh, a great deal in their beautiful theatres. Uh, and uh, even in a couple of the theatres that are mentioned in the book, one of which, by the way, is at the Theatre Royal in Hobart. They go touring far and wide, you know, Perth and Queensland and, and uh, the dear Theatre Royal, which is the oldest uh, still functioning theatre in the whole of Australia, and it's gorgeous, complete with Ghost, Fred. Um, I've performed at the Theatre Royal twice and have never seen Fred, which is such a pity, um, my dear friend Jackie Weaver has. I've recognised her in the book as having, well, just in acknowledgements, having seen Fred. She'll swear to it, as many will. But Fred is a real ghost at the Theatre Hall. And there are others. Beautiful one at the Princess Theatre in Melbourne. Uh, so despite the fact of not being able to travel with COVID, I could wander down the lane of these, of Melbourne's historical theatres and... And it's not quite the same as being there and wandering the streets and seeing them, you know, 150 years ago. Not quite the same. But uh, I did feel a great knowledge. And the beauty of coming back to my first great love of theatre and in writing of it historically, uh, I, I, I was hit by the strangest sense of familiarity. Um because although I'm dealing with a period way before my existence from the 1880s virtually when my troops came out here to uh, the end of World War I, 1920, uh, in essence, the spirit of the theatre and the people who inhabit it hasn't actually changed 
all that much. There, there are so many recognisable factors, one being, as I've mentioned, the ghosts. So many old theatres have ghosts. Terrible things happen in theatres. Uh, I mean, fire is prevalent. Nearly every, every old theatre has been burnt down. Uh, very often, thank goodness, to be, you know, resurrected and refurbished. But um, theatres are rampant with fires, mainly through the the uh, the lime that is was used in the lights during those early days. Uh, it's a caustic uh, chemical reaction. Uh, hence, you get seeking the limelight and all of that because lime was used in these lamps. So fire is a big one. People die in fires. There are, and there are always ghosts from terrible accidents happen in theatres. So uh, I love the, the prevalence of people who believe in ghosts in the theatre and the ghosts are there. I love the superstitions that still exist and did way back in the time of which I'm writing. Uh, one of the most famous being never mention the Scottish play. So I'm sure most people know when the Scottish play is mentioned without its title. Uh, the reference is actually to Macbeth, but um, uh, not only is the title never to be mentioned, but no quote ever from the play unless you are actually performing the play. And in the performance of the play, there, it is always beset with, uh, with terrible accidents. Uh, so uh, the reason for this is that evidently Shakespeare, when he wrote The Witches on the Heath, the three witches, you know, double, double, boil and trouble and, you know, Eye of Newt and all of that, cackles included, that the spell they were quoting was actually a real spell, so that there is a spell on Macbeth. I always liked that one, yeah. Uh, so if you do actually inadvertently come up with a quote from Macbeth and you happen to be in a dressing room, uh, you by rights, you have to be sent outside turn around three times, the door shut behind you, turn around three times, knock, be allowed to come in, then spit or curse or both, dependent upon what the belief is in that particular theatre, and then the spell will be, you know, that, that'll be okay, you'll be forgiven. Uh, so there's all of these things. There's also uh, the interesting one of no whistling anywhere in the theatre, well, particularly backstage dressing rooms or anything. Uh, the reason for that is a practical one. Uh, because in, in the old days, it's no longer practical, but, you know, so many things that are not practical are still absolute gospel in the theatre. Uh, the practical reason was because in the old days, that particular the period of which I write, heavy great backdrops and scrims and things were flown in from the flies, the flies being the area above the stage, which the audience can't see. And there are stagehands up there, you know, and they're, they're dropping things down, these heavy backdrops. There are stagehands in the wings, hauling on great big ropes, uh, hefting up these counterweights, you know, for this. So everything is going up and down and in between. And, and uh, they, they exchange um, their messages to each other what's going to happen when, uh, with a series of signals. So if you were to inadvertently whistle, you could end up with something very heavy landing on your head or on somebody else's head, so you don't whistle. So that, that is kept, uh, no whistling. And again, if you do it, you might have to be, go outside, turn around and all of that. Um, and the other little one, which I find so sweet, and I actually was in a show at the Comedy Theatre in Melbourne when this actually happened, you don't come backstage with a a bouquet of flowers that has any forms of lilies in it because lilies are used in funeral wreaths and that could mean the death of the show. So, yeah, a, a friend of mine actually did. Somebody brought in a bouquet of flowers and it was actually a bloke they were presented to, not even a, a, a woman. And, uh, and Fred uh, just threw it straight out the window, uh, which seemed a bit rude, but, oh, no, death of the show. Uh, so... Um, I think right now, oh, yeah, the, just to lead into the piece I'm going to read, if that's okay, I hope you'll be interested, is um, the, the, the most essential thing that hasn't really changed at all is, of course, the whole thing that the show must go on. Uh, everything, everything happens in the theatre and the show must go on. It, this is, again, just touching on today's very tragic times for everybody. Uh, but in the performing arts, of course, theatres are have been forced to go dark, which is the term you put, you know. But um, so the show hasn't been able to go on, which is pretty, you know, unprecedented, really. Uh, and uh, the, the beauty, another superstition of the theatre is not allowed to go dark entirely. Uh, theatres will put up a ghost light 
which will sit in the middle of the theatre. So the theatre is never totally black. Uh, and anyway, our shows will go on, and I hope everybody will go and see them when they're opening, which they currently are starting to now. But I think one of the greatest examples of the show must go on would be the Windmill Theatre in uh, the centre of the West End in London, just a great windmill street running off Piccadilly Circus. I did a gig there once, actually. Um, beautiful old theatre, uh, still there. And during World War II, uh, they continued to perform throughout the Blitz, throughout all the bombing of London. Uh, they would make an announcement to the audience when the air sirens sounded and they'd say, anybody who wants to leave the theatre, please leave. Uh, the show will go on. And uh, the show did, after which the performers and crew and everything would dive down into the basement, which formed as a uh, as a bunker. Uh, so for years after that, I don't know if they still have that, they might well, that great big neon sign out the front that said, uh, we never closed, which I think is fabulous. So that's a prime example. Now, I thought I might read a little section of the book that is a, pretty much an episode where the show had to go on. Right, so uh, as you heard, there are there are a couple of uh, entrepreneurs that we are mainly dealing with, the Worthing family who become a great family of entrepreneurs, and there's Carlo and Rube. Now, Carlo and Rube met in an orphanage in London. They're Cockney blokes. And they came out here actually to, to find gold. They came out before the Worthing family and they were too late. So they decided, well, they'd, uh, they'd, they'd toured as boxers, you know, teenage kids, uh, as uh, in boxing, touring things in London, uh, outside, up into the Midlands from London. So they thought, well, we'll do that around the goldfields. And those boxing tents were very popular. Now they have become entrepreneurs. They've moved up in the world. So it's now, it's 1899. And the big show Bonanza is currently performing at the Princess Theatre in Melbourne. The great Goldini's performance was coming to its conclusion and the grand finale was to be an illusion of vast proportion. So vast, in fact, that it warranted the return of the show's master, Carlo himself. And now, ladies and gentlemen, he proclaimed, a drum roll having heralded both his appearance and the import of his announcement, the denouement for which you have all been waiting. The disappearing tiger. Everything you have read and heard of the great Goldini's mastery is about to unfold before you right here on this very stage. Behold. Another drum roll as he gestured to the OP side. Opposite prom. All three of them gestured in unison. Carlo the great Goldini, and the beautiful Cassandra, while from the wings two stagehands pushed out a trolley upon which sat a large cage. The tiger, Carlo bellowed dramatically, and perhaps a little unnecessarily, as a wave of gasps rippled through the audience like wind on water. Inside the cage was indeed a tiger, prowling restlessly, unsettled by the lights and the drum roll and the general commotion. The tiger, Carlo continued seamlessly, which through the mastery of the great Goldini will disappear before your very eyes, thence to be returned, dramatic pause for effect, as a kitten. He bashed the front of the cage with his hand, a signal for the animal to growl and slap back with its giant paw, either due to its training or its irritation. No one was sure, least of all Carlo. Or for that matter, the Goldinis, who had bought the beast from a circus that was going bust. They didn't know its background. The big cat obeyed, baring its teeth with a snarl, whacking its paw against the bars, and another ripple of gasps, very audible this time, ran through the audience. A tiger turned into a kitten, Carlo emphatically enthused, bracing, uh, pacing downstage, arms outstretched, embracing the whole of the house, a feat never before witnessed, on any stage in the world. The music was about to strike up and Carlo was about to leave the stage to the Goldinis 
and their mime and the impressive display of special effects. But that was as far as he got. There was not a sound from the orchestra pit, and the gasps had become far more than a ripple. Both the musicians and the audience were alarmed, and with just cause. Behind him, the gate of the cage had slowly swung open, and the tiger stood there, facing directly out front, surveying the freedom that beckoned. The Goldinis, posed either side of the cage as they were, exchanged looks of horror. Neither could move, husband and wife simultaneously rooted to the spot. Then the tiger stepped out from the cage, negotiating the one-foot drop from the trolley with threatening elegance. The beautiful Cassandra gave a terrified scream and headed for the wings OP, while the great Goldini raced for the prompt side, equally terrified but cursing his wife. He'd never wanted to do this trick in the first place, but she'd insisted exotic animals were the latest thing, and the bigger the better. Cassie could be so dumb. Carlo turned to see what all the ruckus was about. He froze. The tiger was standing centre stage, its eyes following the direction from whence the screams were still audible. The screams stopped. Someone had shut Cassie up. The tiger turned its attention to the next distraction, which was Carlo. It took a step towards him, then paused, yellow eyes unblinkingly fixed upon this creature of interest. Those in the front row of the stalls were starting to panic. People were getting up out of their seats, prepared to flee. Then, no, don't go, Carlo said, the voice of calm, but also the voice of compelling authority. There's no cause for panic, I assure you. It's all part of the act. And they believed him. They sat back down in their seats. The musicians in the orchestra pit knew better. Being the professionals they were, however, they did not disrupt the performance, choosing instead to quickly and silently steal away. Carlo was left to put on a show. He faced the tiger. Here, kitty, he said. Here, kitty, kitty. And incredible as it was, there were laughs from the house. A nervous laughs, perhaps, but laughs nonetheless, so far, so good, he thought. Adrenaline coursing through his veins, he had them under control. He took off his tailcoat and, holding it out in front of him like a cape, adopted a matador pose. Toro, he said. Toro, Toro. He didn't dare jiggle the coat as a matador might his cape for fear of agitating the beast. But this was showtime. He had to make things entertaining. The tiger totally focused upon Carlo and, perhaps intrigued by the coat, started to pad very slowly towards him, intent upon investigating. Carlo equally slowly backed away. Toro, Kitty, Toro, he said. The mention of Kitty didn't raise a laugh this time, the audience holding its collective breath, not daring to break the moment. As if in slow motion, man and beast circled the stage. Carlo cautiously backing, the tiger following, or was it stalking? Was it at any moment about to pounce? At one point, Carlo, in his determination to entertain, gave the coat a small jiggle and the tiger swiped a huge paw at it, a shared gasp from the audience, a very taut moment. No, he decided he wouldn't try that again. But the tiger did seem intrigued by the coat, Carlo realised. Tigers and kittens are very closely related, he said, keeping his voice calm in order not to excite the beast, but making sure at the same time it reached well out into the auditorium. The acoustics at the Princess Theatre were excellent, as he knew. They're all just the same, really, he went on. It's only a matter of size, wouldn't you agree? Here, Kitty, he called once again, the coat still held at arm's length. Here, Kitty, Kitty. No laugh, but he hadn't expected there would be. The circle was nearly completed now. They were back to the cage. Beside him was the open gate. Did he dear? He backed a step or two further. The tiger was beside the open gate now. 
Yes, he decided he did. Carlo jiggled the coat more vigorously this time, and as the tiger once again swiped at it, he quickly pulled his arms into his chest, the animal's paw missing him by inches. Then, in one swift action, he hurled the coat into the cage and stood facing the tiger, wondering which option would find favour. What's it to be, he thought. The coat or me? But as fate decreed, the tiger automatically followed the source of its interest, the coat. Its circus trainer had used a cape, which the animal had always found irritating. With a snarl, it leapt into the cage. Carlo slammed the gate closed, giving the bars a brief rattle to ensure the catch had firmly clocked, then whirled about to face the audience. Olay, he said, which was another bullfighting term he'd heard somewhere. Good kitty. Adopting full showman pose, he again triumphantly embraced the house. The tiger did not exactly disappear, I grant you, he announced. But as you can see, it did become a kitten. Beat that, he thought. And he took his bows to thunderous applause, while behind him the tiger now slumped on its belly, ripped into the tailcoat, tearing it to shreds. Backstage... The adrenaline having instantly deserted him, Carlo threw up into a fire bucket. So that's an example of the show must go on. I think he, uh, yes, he, he met the moment and soldiered on, as I think all performers do. So um, thank you, my dear. So are there any, any uh, questions going around, Ita? I'll ask. No one has put anything up, but I'll ask once again. If anybody got any questions to Judy and thank you so much Judy that was so lovely oh, thank you yeah. but, um, like I said I'm up to three page 348 and it's so nice to hear it in your voice not in my yeah. accent <laughs> lovely okay well while we're waiting in case we've got a few minutes haven't we yep. yeah, yeah yeah for sure we serve like okay uh, well so. I'll tell you another ghost story for instance this is a beauty and it's I I have put it in the book they talk about it but it's a true one it's at the princess theater which funnily enough is the theater there where I have my you know fictitious character Carlo doing a fictitious thing that uh, could very well have happened believe me but this is a real one it was in I think it was uh 1904 uh and JC Williamson's James uh, Cassius Williamson of the famous JCWs, which was referred to as the firm. It was the the uh, a, a big entrepreneurial company started out by JC himself, himself. And it was a production he was doing of Faust. Don't know whether one can ask. Oh, sorry. Okay. Someone just came in. Did you just. Oh. Want Maybe wait till Judy finishes her story. Oh, and I, I, just, <laughs> I, I just found out how to work the damn thing. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> well, Good on you. I have a great deal of trouble with working the damn thing. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, it's the opening night of Faust in 1904. And, uh, and uh, this uh, Frederick Federici was his name. Uh, sounds Italian, and I'm sure he was, but he was brought out from England. He was a very, very famous tenor, hugely popular in England. And he was brought out to play the lead. He's playing Mephistopheles. And the very, very last note of the opera uh, sees Mephistopheles uh, being taken via through the trap door of the theatre, and they have a lift that goes down into the basement. And he is singing the last note of the opera as he goes into, and Federici did. He sang that last note as, and it was, as, as he goes down. And once he was out of sight of the audience, he had a heart attack. And uh, he reached the basement and he, he virtually was dead. And up on stage, the, the curtain calls, you know, and all the actors are up there on stage. And they all swore later on that Federici was there with them holding hands and taking the curtain call. They all said, well, he was there. He was there. But he wasn't. They discovered his body in the basement. They took him up to the green room and, uh, and a doctor was called and he was declared dead. And uh, his, his ghost evidently, for years after that, they kept a, a seat on every opening night for Federici 
vacant, even if the house was full, vacant in, I think it was the third row in the dress circle, a special set for him. And he has been seen by actors and staff uh, to this day, wandering uh, the theatre late at night um, uh, in evening dress, full evening dress. Isn't that a lovely ghost story? I love it. Yes, I like it. I love your ghost stories through the book. I don't like to read him at night. It's too scary. <laughs> oh, but he's a very benign ghost. <laughs> he's a good guy with a great love of the theatre. Sure. There, there is a few questions now. There's one for you. Lee, what was the last stage show that you saw that you really loved? Oh, the last stage show that I saw. Look, I saw, um, oh, look, and it's in Nancy Hayes' Divine Little Theatre. It's named after Nancy, who's one of the loveliest women in the whole of show business. Uh, it used to be the Dialogue Theatre in Sydney, and it's now the Hayes Theatre. And I saw Calamity Jane um, and with a girlfriend of mine who'd worked in the theatre hugely, and she'd re only recently returned from England, and she'd worked. She said, that's better than a productions I've seen late in the West End. And it's this weeny little, oh, God, no, it's, it's oh, it's gorgeous. She's so famous. And, oh, you such a wonderful question. You've taken me by surprise. Um, and she mounted the stage play and played Calam, played Calamity Jane. Oh, she's going to hate me for. Oh God, I hope there's no way she'll ever hear this because she's divided. <laughs> we do. We have recorded this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's okay. She'll she'll forgive me. <laughs> that's great. I haven't heard of that one. Yeah. Uh, there's another Kimberly that wanted to ask Judy. How long, roughly, does it take you to research one of your novels? Oh, the research is. I, I, I'd say probably a, a a good several months, maybe about five months or so. Uh, that's the whole thinking part, the, the getting together of the books I need, uh, field research, going to places, interviewing people, discovering the local historians, uh, doing all of that before I start writing. Then once I have started writing, uh, I continue to research as I go with all of these books that I've got no, you know, little sticket notes in if they're from a library or if they're ones I've bought that I've desecrated, you know. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I research entirely the whole time I'm I'm, I'm read. But I, I put aside, I'd say, about five months. Wow. And when you do read your books, I find you can, like, it sounds so true. So, you know, you can see that you put in an effort to get it right. That's what I find anyway. <laughs> Thank you. <Eva>. Thank <laughs> That's you. okay. Um, then there's a question from Kessie. She's curious, which character is your favourite? Um, which character? Well, in, yeah. in, in, in Showtime. Showtime. I would say Showtime because you have so many books. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> unless, you want, uh, yeah. unless you have a clear favourite in, you know, from all your books. Oh, your your pictures just dropped out. That's okay. Oh, has it? Yeah, right. no, no th there you are. We're back oh, cool. again. Yeah. Uh, look, I <laughs> I I adore them all. I do. I mean, Gertie is obviously as cute as all get out. Mabel is. I adore Mabel. But funnily enough, although Will is a pain in the butt, um, I I love him because he's so reminiscent of so many actors that I do know. He's an amalgamation of many that I do. And he's not a bad bloke. He's up himself a bit. And he's pompous and arrogant and all of that. But he he cares. Um, I, I, I really do like them all. I, I so have to agree with you because when I was thinking when I read it, I thought, oh, I like Gucci, but I like Mabel. Oh, but I like Will. So, yeah, I'm a bit like you. Because <laughs> you make them all so real, like with flaws and everything. They're quite lovable. Well, that's good. I mean, yeah. you know, yes, exactly. There's so many different sides of characters. That's what I love. Yeah, exploring yeah. and painting the characters. Yeah, it's good. How do you get to ask a question? Because I just, have no idea. So you just write it in the chat, but seeing you are now talking, might as well just ask Judy live now, if you like. Hi, Judy. Hello, you're you're obviously as ignorant as I am. With the I, I, look, I'm a bit a bit of a luddite, but not that bad. Um, but I seem like I feel tonight like I'm an absolute amateur. Um, Judy, my name is David Foster, and you may remember me. I was an actor once upon a time in the olden days. 
Oh, David, hello. Of course I do. Darling, I'm far more of a Luddite than you are. Believe me. Hello, David. Good to hear from you. I, I, I just wondered. I, I, I'm a bit of a virgin as far as your books are concerned, and I'm now determined, having heard all about Showtime, that I'm going to get it. So, uh, but I, 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 can I ask you, I, I always thought when I suddenly realised that you had become a writer, I thought, oh, she's writing romantic novels. No. Um, for young ladies or, or or something and of course you don't <laughs> so i i was really intrigued to know because i knew you as an actor and then you became a writer and i was i had no idea i mean you i don't know how long ago it was but i thought what's she doing she's a writer isn't that amazing and she's doing well because i kept on seeing your name all the time how did you begin <laughs> why did you begin why did you begin and how did you begin well, you want my life story, really, don't you, David? <laughs> I mean, it's been 30 years uh, of writing. Um, by the way, I do have to, uh, because it's all come back to me when I was talking about Calamity Jane mm -hmm. and the divine performance at the Hayes Theatre, and, of mm -hmm. course, it was the beautiful Virginia Gay. And if you can mm -hmm. ever see Virginia Gay in anything on stage, just go, because she's magical. She's so talented. Okay, David. Um, look, I, I actually think, given your background as an actor too, I think to move on to writing is a very, very natural progression for mm -hmm. actors who've been around as long as you and I have. Uh, mo many actors uh, decide to segue into another area of the industry. They become script writers or they become directors or indeed they start producing their own mm. song, whatever. That's a natural progression. So from then to go on into writing in narrative form, uh, to me, was just another blessing so that you don't have uh, parameters set all around you. You know, you don't have budgets and things that restrict you. You can, you can move freely. So I love writing in narrative form, Okay. You you Thank found you, a you, you you found a niche obviously because a lot of a lot of actors I know always talk about writing the book, and you know and and I've thought about writing the book or the play and of course one first of all you've got to find a publisher it's impossible and so on and so forth and and you've managed to to do it and no aren't I lucky aren't I lucky look write your book David it's very good for you so do it whether you get it whether you get it published or not but just do it. Start it, begin it, and do it. That's my. That's mind. right. So I've just muted. Um, sorry, David, I had to mute you because we're running out. We've got other people, yeah. <laughs> um, there was one more question from Sarah, and she said, "Who would Judy choose to play the main character in Showtime if it was made into a film?" Well, there's actually quite a few main characters, so choose your pick. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, yes, exactly. Who is the main character? Uh, they are all main characters. And um, look, I really reckon this is an area for fantasizing. I reckon, sorry, who, who, who am I speaking Sarah. to? Sarah. Sarah. Sarah, I have a great test for you. This is an exercise for you to do. You think of your favorite actors and you cast the movie. I think you'll have great fun doing that. And then we can tell Judy afterwards. Yeah. Judy, this was so much fun. Thank you so much for coming to Tamworth virtually. And hopefully, you know, after COVID, you can come again and see us in real life because it's fabulous having you in the library. And I know we always get a huge crowd when you're in. Um, if you want to read um, Judy's books, you can get them through the library. Um, and we have um, Collins Booksellers of Tamworth. They are always supportive of our um, events, so you can get her books there as well. Um, I would like to thank the audience, of course, but really, really, I would like to thank Judy for coming to Tamworth. So if everybody, if you want to, you can put your sound on and you can put your um, video on so you can wave to Judy. And I just want to say thank you so much. Loved it. Look, Eta, oh, look at all you gorgeous people. <laughs> this is all right. And Eta, thank you for all for coming in on a, a whole thing. And Eta, thank you for conducting such a lovely, a lovely get together. Oh, thank it you, was Tabby. lovely. Thank you. Bye. Bye. For more CNRL Author Talks and other podcasts, visit our website at cnl.nsw.gov.au or follow your CNRL branch Facebook page. You can also watch many of our author talks. Just search YouTube for CNRL interviews. This podcast was recorded at Tamworth City Library with music by Chad Crouch, a.k.a. Poddington Bear, from the freemusicarchive.org.
I'm Jonathan from the CNRL Library Innovation Studio. See you next time for more CNRL Author Talks.